Hello students, this is the final module that you're going to have to do. The timing of the course ended up being such that we're not going to get to the other modules after module 14, so you can scratch those off of the syllabus. And um, this will be the last module. So what I'm going to do in this module 14 is not only talk about chapter 14 in the book, but I'm also going to talk about how to put a narrative arc into your research project, because that's the stage where each of us are now. Um, or should be in the uh, course. So what I want you to do is take what you learned from module 14, which kind of encapsulates the entire semester um, in the textbook, and put that together into how you put elements into your research project. And then what I'm going to do at the end of this module is talk to you about how to build a research project into a narrative arc, which is uh, a, a, a process of creating the purpose early in your research project, talking about the problems that you've identified which gave you that purpose, then identify what others have said about that problem, and then bring your work together, which is a minimum of two peer-reviewed journal articles, um, which you bring in as archival data, and talk about how those two authors in their research have underscored the existence of this problem that you've identified, or purpose that you've identified, and then through your own research design, talk about how you would develop or how you have developed a theory of, of, of a possible solution which may be new in the field, um, or at least innovative, and thereby create this methodology section for your research project where you talk about how the work of others and your idea for this theory come together and then you make your conclusion, which is where you make your claim, even if it is a future claim for a research project that has not been done yet, but you have just proposed in your research project. Um, so that's how we're going to proceed through this chapter, this module. Um, what I need you to understand first off is that, and, and several of you missed this, and I apologize if it's been something that I omitted in the videos early on in, this, in the uh, semester. What some of you have missed as it relates to my methodology for teaching this course is the fact that there's this firewall in between what you're going to do as a research project and what the assignments were about as we worked through the semester. So assignments number one, two, three, four came before the midterm. We wrote the midterm and then you did assignment number five and then we're now going to do the final exam at the end of the semester. Those had this firewall which kept them separate from being anything related to your research project unless you chose to incorporate them into your research project. There was no obligation and there was no intent on my part that you incorporate anything out of these assignments into your research project. They had nothing to do with your research project other than the fact that they contribute elements of teaching so that you understand more about what you would incorporate yourself into your research project. For example, assignment number one was about how to discuss a topic with passion. I wanted you to find something in the news that you were compa that you had passion for, that you uh, felt a fire in your belly about that, and you wanted to understand it more, so you dug into it deeper. Um, and I wanted you to do that and include a diagrammatic model of, of the problem as you saw it, as presented by some article, news story, or research project that somebody else has done. Assignment number two was about doing this descriptive study and evaluating the methods. Um, so, for example, what, were you going to use sampling or observation or our archival methods in order to get into your research? Um, and, and also, assignment number two was about identifying your population of interest. What I wanted you to do and take from assignment number one as it related to your research project was I wanted you to know how to pick a topic um, you didn't have to pick the topic from assignment number one. I wanted you to understand that you could do what you did in assignment number one to pick your topic for your research project. From assignment number two, what I wanted you to understand was how were you going to explore the methodology within the topic that you choose for your research project. I gave you specific examples in assignment number two, but they had nothing to do with your research project. Your research project was going to be a topic of your own choosing. Um, and you didn't have to incorporate anything from assignment number two other than these ideas of how you're going to study and evaluate the methods 
that would be most appropriate for a specific topic. In this case, your research project, your topic. Assignment number three was all about working from a, the diagram to find your unit of analysis. And, and so I wanted you to also practice in assignment number three um, how you would write your own hypotheses. So that was what assignment number three was about. Once again, it had nothing to do with your research project other than the fact that in your research project you would have to do that. So I wanted you to practice in assignment number three how to do it so that when you pick a topic of your own choosing in your own research project, you could incorporate what you learned from assignment number three into writing your own hypotheses, figuring out what your unit of analysis would be, and defining your purpose um, and, and doing a diagrammatic model and pulling from that diagrammatic model the unit of analysis. And that's how we write our hypothesis or hypotheses. Assignment number four was all about citing your work, um, practicing how to do it. Module nine video also incorporated how to pull ideas out of various articles to create an outline for your research project. So now in assignment number four, what you're doing is you're digging deeper into every topic. And, and so with that, you would need to, you, you were finding what would be elements of an outline. So I wanted you to learn from assignment number four how to pull elements out of various research topics into your outline. But while you're pulling together your outline, you're going to be finding things that you're going to need to cite. So it was important in module nine and assignment number four that while you're putting together your outline, you are pulling accurate and um, um, precise citations for your work because a lot of your work, your, your work has no validity if it is not based upon the research of others. So you had to learn how to cite your sources, give people credit for their journalism, give people credit for their research, and you would be finding all of these things while you're putting together your outline. So it was important that you know in assignment number four how to do citations. But once again, nothing in assignment number four had anything at all to do with your research project. Your research project only had to, anything to do with your own topic of your own choosing. Assignment number four was just pulling random ideas out of a hat, and they were in no way meant to be incorporated into your research project. Um, and some of you missed that, and you tried to incorporate these ideas from assignment number four into your own research project, but there was, there was no connecting tissue for that to be done, and so you were pulling your hair out trying to figure out what you were doing wrong. Well, what you were doing wrong is you hadn't picked your own topic. And, and brought that through. And so now what I want to be able to teach you after this um, video is how to do a narrative arc and build this all in together. Um, and I did that, I gave you an example in the midterm and that was what I was trying to do with question number four in the midterm was to teach you the, the idea of, okay, I'm going to put myself into the position of a researcher and I'm going to think about how I'm going to describe a population that I'm interested in. And then once you've learned how to describe that population, while you're putting together the survey, you can start pulling data out from your study population to find out exactly where you're going to focus your research. Because until you have focused your research, you can't really put together a research project. And that was what assignment question number four in the midterm was meant to give you, was practice in doing that. Assignment number five, um, after the midterm was all about how to interpret histograms and uh, understanding the mean, the median, and the mode, and interpreting cross tabulations and interpreting regressions. And that is just interesting information that you would probably find when you get into your peer reviewed sources. People will talk about their research in terms of cross tabulations and histograms and the means and medians and modes and the regressions. And so you needed to understand that as you get into your peer reviewed sources. In and incorporate those charts and infographics into your research project and your presentation. So this was how to interpret secondary data, and that's what you were meant to learn from assignment number five. And so now we're at the point where we're going to be writing up your almost finished draft, and, um, and once we're through all of this, you're going to write the final exam, and that's going to incorporate all of this, and everything on this chart here is then going to be fair game for the final exam. Um, but you're going to have the opportunity to finish your research project first. So that's what I want you to know now, is that there is this firewall in between your research project and all of the assignments and the examples that I used in the exam. Um, but we're going to return to this, especially question number four, to show you how to build a from the midterm exam. 
to, um, to show you how to build a narrative arc into your research project. And that's going to help you do your research design and your methodology section and draw it to a conclusion. And that's what some of you are having trouble with now as you're working on your almost finished draft. So just to refresh your memory about what was on the midterm, question number four, um, before we get into chapter 14 of the textbook, um, uh, we, I, I presented a scenario where you were supposed to put yourself in the position of a researcher. You were going to design a research project and I wanted you to imagine yourself as the person doing all of the work. Um, I, I didn't want you to try and get inside my head, I, I wanted you to get inside the problem so that you could put together your own thoughts and ideas as it related to this problem. I think what some of you missed was you um, you didn't catch on to the idea that I actually did base this on research. Um, my peer-reviewed source for this question came from the work done by Brian Mustansky. And Brian Mustansky and his peers uh, put together this research, and it was just published this April, about how they envisioned an America where sexual orientation inequities in adolescent health would no longer exist. Um, what they were trying to do with their research and what they accomplished with their research is they were telling individuals, they were telling educational professionals, they were telling pediatricians, they were telling um, mental health um, professionals, they were telling school teachers and principals and parents especially that we are creating social inequities in adolescents by treating sexual orientation as a defect in our young people. So if we can get around the idea that having non-conforming gender identities is a defect, then we can actually raise our adolescents in a climate and an environment where they will feel absolutely normal and in a similar situation as their heterosexual peers. So that's the research that I base this on, and the research is now decades old. Um, it's been ongoing since 1973, but the research is now supporting the idea and, and all of the mental health professionals are on board, all of the educational professionals are on board, all of the pediatricians are on board with this research. And it's only these weird outliers who want to try and incorporate religion into science somehow to justify religion with their spurious correlations who are, are, are against this idea that what these researchers are putting together. Because these researchers are by far in the majority and there's only these fringe researchers out there who are trying to say that you can change sexual orientation and that's what you should be doing with young people in adolescence is trying to teach them how to be heterosexual when there is nothing in their constitution that makes them feel heterosexual and so that's the researchers position which I wanted you to actually incorporate so if I were writing a research project I would start my research project by identifying the problem that I just described to you in exactly the same way that I just described it to you, supporting all of the claims that I made with this person's research, with this team of researchers, and there's other peer-reviewed journals that I'm going to uh, that I could incorporate in this as well. But I wanted you to see this as my starting point for my research project, and this is where I'm going to build my narrative arc from. Is this foundation? I have this really, really strong foundation from which to start the discussion in my research paper, if I were writing one, about what I gave to you in question number four of the midterm. So now let's return to question number four, and this is what I gave you to start your thinking in question number four of the midterm. I wanted you to put yourself into the position of a researcher who was going to design this study. And what you had to first do, as I explained in the paper, um, in the midterm was that I, you had to have your survey participants self-identify as one of five gender identities for your study. Um, and, and so the, this is where question number one in the survey came from and I gave you that. Um, and I gave you the idea that, okay, um, do, which group out of these five do you identify in? Are you a heterosexual male, heterosexual female, gay male, lesbian, or other gender identity? That gave the identity. That was a given to you in the midterm question. And then what I asked of you was that you ask a question in this survey as a researcher that would give you a degree of magnitude for which these study participants used hookup apps. And the hookup apps were, you know, Grindr or Blender, uh, whichever one 
they are familiar with, but and, and, and I described to you very clearly what a hookup app was and how these hookup apps create a situation where these young, young, these young people put themselves at high risk for sexual assault and sexually transmitted diseases and other social ills which are incorporated with casual approaches to sex. Um, and so this idea that we want to look at young adults who are taking a very casual approach to sex gave us the gave you and what I wanted you to understand in the midterm was that you needed to identify number one which population may be the most prone to using hookup apps and in order to understand which population is the most prone to using hookup apps you needed to also find out from them how often they actually use hookup apps and so that's the lowest magnitude to highest magnitude have they never ever used hookup apps do they even know what one is that would be the first degree of magnitude no never ever used it don't even know what it is second degree of magnitude is yeah I used it once didn't like it not gonna use it again third degree of magnitude would be you know what I yeah, if, if, if I wasn't dating somebody I would use it but right now I'm going steady with somebody so I hardly ever use it anymore but yeah I did meet somebody on it but it wasn't the person and, and so you would get some degree of understanding about which one of these five populations are putting themselves most at risk by heavy use of hookup apps now that that creates the starting point of your narrative arc if you're if I, if I were to use this in my research project at this point in time, all I have is a starting point. I have identified risky behavior, and I've identified the population that engages in that risky behavior more frequently than any other. But what do I do with that? Well, what you do with it is you do what this person did here with his research, and so at that, that point, you cite in your research project the your first peer-reviewed source of secondary research. And you tell me, as the person who's going to be reading, as your audience, you tell your audience in your research project what this person said in his research or her research about this behavior. So I've identified, well, you've identified in question number four, the midterm, you identified an at-risk population and what they are doing to put themselves at risk. And this guy is saying now, in his research, why they are so prone to putting themselves at risk. And this is what I wanted you to think of as a researcher, and this is what I wanted you to identify in part F of question number four on the midterm, is what direction are you now going to go with this research, with this information that you have? You now have identified the at-risk population and you have identified the behavior that puts them at risk. Why do they do it? And this is your research design. So now at this point we have reached in a narrative arc of your research project. If you think of it as an arc that goes from identifying the problem and the purpose, identifying your hypothesis and your theory, now you're into the methodology. What are you going to do in your research project to describe why this phenomenon takes place? And what you're going to do if you're going to follow the logic that I gave you in question number four of the midterm is you're going to ask one more question that said, please choose the answer that best describes your parents' opinion of your dating desires and or activities when you were between the age of 18 and 25. You're now going to understand and you're going to try and get in the head of these individuals, your population of interest. What caused them, or is there something that was part of their upbringing that put them into a frame of mind where they take on such high-risk behavior and, and, and willingly engage in behavior that they know to be high-risk? And here's how you do it. You ask them questions about whether they had acceptance as a young adult by their parents, by their community, by their church community, by their school community. Did they feel that they could date the person that they were genuinely interested in dating? Or did they have to live inauthentically? Did they have to live a lie? Did they have to pretend to be something they were not in order to have that acceptance? And what this research shows and what I can bring into my research project if I was writing this. I would, I would bring in the work of Mustansky and cite him in telling my readers that this high-risk behavior came as a result of never having dated as a young adult or having faked your dating practices and dated somebody that your parents wanted you to date but you had no interest in dating or you had to date in secret and you had to be closeted entirely and not be authentic or genuine to anybody or you might have dated people that 
you knew your parents would not approve of and you just said, you know what, forget it. You're not going to approve of the people I like anyway, so I'm just going to date the people I like. And your parents would have then been very disapproving of you. And or were you in this bottom category where you had your parental and your parents endorsed the people that you were dating and saying, wow, we're really impressed with the girl, the guy that you bring home. And if you are a gay child or if you are a lesbian, if your parents gave you that kind of acceptance, what this Mostansky's research shows is that that kind of acceptance was absolutely critical to having a, a normal and moral be attitude toward dating. Um, if, if you could date authentically, even if, if you could date authentically regardless of your gender orientation, then you would grow and develop and mature in all of the ways that we in society expect young adults to grow and mature as they date through their adolescent years. And that is the whole purpose of assignment number four, uh, and question number four in the midterm, and that's why I asked it. In order to do that, you had to understand how to interpret a cross-tabulation, which is where a lot of you had trouble. And so the, um, I, I gave you assignment number five after that to make sure that you better understood how to do cross-tabulations yourself. Um, and trust me, cross-tabulations and histograms are going to be on the final exams. There is no more basic element of research than a cross-tabulation because it is so critically important to having a description of your study population. Of your population of interest can only be described by breaking them down into subpopulations. That's your rows, that's your columns on a cross-tabulation. And, and then your rows of the cross-tabulation breaks them into degrees of magnitude so that you can understand these traits about your population of interest. And only then can you actually talk about a research project because you have identified, number one, your unit of analysis, number two, your population of interest, and you've been able to break down both of those um, research objectives into measurable categories or identities. And that's why question number four was so critically important. Um, and then that's why understanding cross tabulations is going to continue to be important. So now let's talk about chapter 14. Chapter 14 talks about how to put everything that you've learned so far into your research project. Um, you base your study on past research. That's a critically important aspect of this whole course, is you use past research to help you define and refine your topic. You use past research to help determine what research questions most warrant further investigation. That's going to be very, very important in you putting together your own research project. What can you contribute? What do you want to further investigate? And finally, use past research to help determine the best research design. So you've got research design done by other people. Mustansky's research design was what I incorporated in my imaginary research project that I gave you as question number four on the midterm. So in choosing a research design, are you going to pursue internal or external validity? Um, I wanted both, if I had to pick on question number four that I gave you for the midterm, um, I would have to say that um, I wanted external validity because I want other people to understand that by denying adolescents the ability to date authentically and find and bring home individuals that they are actually interested in loving and spending the rest of their life with, unless you give them that opportunity and unless you give them that support as parents and as a community in the church community or as a school community um, or as a social network for these individuals, they're not going to develop normally. And that's what Mustansky's research is. That, that's external validity. We want other people, we want to be able to convince other people that this is critically important. We want external validity so that as the title of Mustansky's research states, we have an America without gender, without sexual orientation inequity in adolescent health. We want adolescent health to improve. We want teenagers and young adults to date in healthy patterns and the healthy patterns for dating are now researched and documented as having a baseline of sexual orientation um, equality. And then you ask yourself, um, are you going to have to use quasi-experimental design? Because quasi-experimental design gives better external validity than other experiments do. Um, so, so mine was definitely a quasi-experimental design because the survey went out to people in such a way that I was breaking down subpopulations. 
Um, and I did not have a control population per se, I just identified one population as the identity, five identities. So I broke my five identities down, um, but I didn't necessarily have a control population. So I had a quasi-experimental design. Um, part number two here, is your goal to describe, predict, or explain? A descriptive design is one thing, a correlational design is quite another thing. And an experiment explains things, or a quasi-experiment explains things. So this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to explain. I didn't want to look for a correlation, other than the fact that I, I did want to find a correlation between the acceptance that young people had of their chosen dating partners. But I more or less wanted to, I knew what I was going to find there, because other research supported that. So Mustansky's research supported the correlation, and so I was setting about to actually explain. And so one of my peer-reviewed journal articles that I based my research on was the correlation already done for me. And so it was only up to me then to explain as described here in the third point. So here is on uh, figure 14.1 in the textbook, you have the thought process and you can follow this path down to tell you what you're going to actually do. So rely upon this path as you put together your um, research project and you start writing. And, and then build your narrative arc based on what you come up with on this diagram here. So figure 14.1 is going to be critically important. Practice 14.1 will actually allow you to work through that a little bit, so I want you to do practice 14.1. Um, and, and it gives you the answers to part number one, um, but as it describes here, answers to part number two will vary based on your research questions. And, but, I, but I want you to think of your own research project don't, don't do anything out of the textbook. Remember, we have this firewall in between what you read in the textbook and what you're actually doing your own research project on. So, so don't conflate them together. Um, just do this as an assignment. Think in your head, how does this apply to my topic? And then incorporate it into your topic, your research project. Additional decisions that you need to make include how many groups. Into how many groups will your variable typically be divided? What is warranted based on past research? Um, and are you talking about independent or dependent groups? So um, that is in the textbook. I want you to read that to determine whether you are talking about an independent or a dependent group. Um, and that's fairly much it for the textbook. Um, what I want you to do now then is I want you to think in terms of maybe go through and read question number four on the midterm one more time and try and get a better understanding of why I asked the questions that I did. And, and where I was going with that questioning, with that line of questioning, with my, with, with my attempt to describe my population of interest, um, and then incorporate the actual um, thinking from that into this figure 14.2. And, and you can do that on your own research project as well. So what I did for question number four on the midterm was I asked the opening question here off of figure 14.2, is it possible for a participant or subject to be in more than one group? So yes or no. Um, I, I, I separated my group out into five subpopulations. They had to pick, so they weren't going to be in more than one group. Um, is within groups error a major concern? Um, probably not. And so work through this. If It may not apply 100% to the way you're designing your research project, but it may actually contain some very, very important ideas about you. And, and identifying dependent group design or independent group design or dependent groups design repeated measures. Um, and so, so these, these are just here to perhaps spur some thinking on your part here. Um, if, if, you, if this does not make a lot of sense to you at this point in time, don't worry about figure 4.2, 14.2. It's not that critical to you doing your research project. A lot of it has to do with parts of the chapter, parts of the textbook that we didn't cover in detail. So if it doesn't make sense to you, you, you don't need to lose sleep over how to incorporate figure 14.2 into your actual research project. Um, should you conduct a factorial design, do you have reason to expect that the relationship between your variables will depend on a third moderating variable? In almost every circumstance, yes. I have tried to describe the intervening variables in every one of your models because there are intervening variables in almost every research model, which means that you're going to have to have a second hypothesis and possibly even a third hypothesis that describes these intervening variables, these factors. Um, 
And are there confounds or extraneous variables that you want to systematically control using a factorial design? The factorial design is that idea of intervening variables. Do you want to encumber your research by going into these intervening variables, or do you just want to identify them as an intervening variable and say, you know what, we know that this is a factor in the correlation that we're trying to study, but it's beyond the scope of this research. And you can just leave it off, take it off the table so that you don't have to deal with it. Identify it as a known and say that's going to be the topic of future research and you're done with it. You don't need to bring it into your um, research. So try and keep your research very, very focused, very, very tight. And you do that by just taking it off the table and saying, yes, I know it's there, but we're not going to look at it in this project. Practice 14.2 helps you in deciding between the independent and the dependent groups designs. So I want you to work through um, practice 14.2. And once again, part one, it gives you good answers for part two. The answers will vary based on your research questions. Factorial designs, figure 14.3 is a little bit more information about how to do that. Start in the middle here with factorial design. Do you expect that the relationship between your predictor, your independent variable, and your outcome, your dependent variable, depends on a second factor? In almost all cases, yes. And or do you want to control for an extraneous or confounding variable? Meaning, or in other words, if you're going to do that, then you're going to say, you know what, I'm going to take this off the table and make it the topic of future research and just talk about the one thing that you're going to focus on. So, but if you're going to incorporate them, then you need to get independent groups designs, factorial, and look at them all as inter in independent, which probably they're not, because that's why we call them intervening variables, is they will impact how the independent variable correlates to or causes the dependent variable change that we're interested in. Um, dependent groups, factorial, all factors are dependent, which is closer to what we want, or a mixed factorial, at least one independent and one dependent factor. Um, and so you can identify, when you, if you get into intervening variables, try and identify them as to how they actually correlate or impact causality. You will likely run into several statistical analysis in a single study. And the appropriate analysis is determined by how many variables you're examining. So top it off at three. If you have one independent variable and two intervening variables is the maximum that I want you to deal with. Um, if you have groups or not, um, if you have groups, whether the groups are independent or dependent, that's or inter intervening, and identify that, and the type of data you have. Are you working with nominal data, ordinal data, interval data, or ratio data? I need to know this as you identify each one of your units of analysis. Each variable will have its own unit of analysis. So your dependent variable will have a unit of analysis. Your independent variable will have a unit of analysis. The intervening variables will have units of analysis. If you look at what I put together, my risk of sexual assault and sexual transmitted disease, what I was looking at there and my dependent variable is the kind of risk that people expose themselves to by a frequent use of hookup apps. Um, so the incident rate of sexually transmitted diseases or the incident rate of assault that came out as a result of using a hookup app is my unit of analysis. I need to count how many of these incidences took place because of somebody meeting somebody through a hookup app. The rate of use of the hookup apps is something that we determined by our survey um, and we had the five degrees of magnitude from which we measured this. Um, the first intervening variable was acceptance of gender identity by parents. So our survey question also broke that down into a unit of analysis um, by breaking that down into five degrees of magnitude and they were going from total acceptance by parents to absolutely no acceptance by parents and maybe that's even ordinal data because they're, they're, whether, whether you were hiding the fact that you were dating somebody of your same gender um, or whether you were lying about dating somebody and so you, you would date people who would put up a front and is the equivalent of a lie, there's, there's no degree of magnitude there. So that probably would be considered nominal data. But we had in their survey question five breaks for our unit of analysis that helped us identify acceptance of gender identity by parents. So my second X2, which was my first intervening variable, had a unit of analysis clearly identified and it had the measure 
for that clearly identified. This is what you do when you talk about research design in your research project. So as part of this narrative arc that you go from identifying a problem to a, methodology, a research design and a methodology and a conclusion, the research design is what I'm doing right now. Identifying each unit of analysis for every one of your dependent variable, independent variable, intervening variables. And strictness to normative values by parent, my X3 here in this example, I haven't even talked about yet, but in a research project I would get into whether these normative values came from parents, culture, religion, community, school environment, um, and those are all my unit of analysis. Where did these normative values come from and how much of a hold did they have on your family, your parents, and yourself and your own identity? And so those three things all come together in, according to the study by Mustansky, all of these things come together in determining how people would use um, the, the, the social ills that come out as a result of having gender inequality in society, especially in adolescence. Just in conclusion here, I want you to think like a researcher. Um, as the cartoon says, would the world be a better place if more people understood research methods and statistics? Uh, the other person says, that's an interesting question. Let's think about how to design a study about it. That's all I wanted you to do. Any problem, any identity, any, any problem or social ill that you come in contact with in your careers, you will want to think of it in terms of how can it be researched. That's the most important question you can ask in any career is how do I better understand this problem? You could be working on an assembly line putting together scissors or widgets and if there is a problem where the process gets bottled up, a research project can help you identify that problem and fix it. It doesn't matter where you work, what you do, it doesn't matter if it's in a healthcare environment, it doesn't matter if it's in a mental health environment, it doesn't matter if you're trying to fix um, water leaks in a municipality's water system. Research is going to get you into it. You're going to have to figure out what kind of statistics, um, as, as the saying goes, I think it was Rudy um, Giuliani said, um, if we can't measure it, we can't fix it. So we have to be able to measure everything. And that's what we're after here, is this research designs allows us to measure just about anything in order to look at it in a way that we can fix it. Once again, thinking in terms of question number four, midterm question number four, and what I just did here in this example, I want you to be able to re... I want you to be able to replicate what I just did as you look at this template. Now, you all have this template. It's on Blackboard. You can download it. It gives you the section headers. Um, most of you found this and you had it in what you sent to me as your first look, and I appreciate that. These section headers are meant to give you a narrative arc. And I want you to think about in terms of what I just did here as it relates to question number four from the midterm to build this narrative arc that goes from introduction to your hypothesis, to your research design, to your literature review. And the literature review can be moved up if you need to. If you need to introduce like I did, I introduced Mustansky very, very early on in my paper. So my literature review had to be moved up before I could actually talk about my research design. So I put my literature review before my research design because I couldn't talk about my research design without Mustansky's work. And then I talk about the methodology, about what I'm going to do here and how I'm going to structure my survey questions. And then I talk about my expected outcomes in my conclusion. Um, so these are all section headers that should be bold, underlined, and on the left margins. Several of you in your first look centered these. They do not, they are not centered in research papers. Research papers have the section headers and subsection headers flush left to the left margin. Um, so make sure that you move them to the left margin. You can put them in bold, you can underline them, and then I want subsection breaks as required in order to give me a very clear point where my eye is supposed to stop and look at something that is important when you change the topic, when you change or introduce something new. Give me a new subsection break because I'm looking very, very quickly at 15 papers in a matter of one day, and they're all 8 to 10 pages long, so I need to be able to go back and find things. If I said, oh, okay, where did he or she say this, and I'm already on page 7 of your paper, I want to be able to go back and find it on page 3. Subsection breaks allow me to do that. It's very, very important in research writing to have section headers and subsection breaks 
all over the place every time your topic changes or you're introducing a new idea or you are summarizing an idea. Um, all of those things are reasons for subsection breaks. And they all flow together in a narrative arc that takes the reader from identifying the problem, understanding the problem, how you're going to look at the problem and research it with your research methodologies, with your research design and your methodology and how you made your work differ from everybody else's work, that's in your methodology, um, what you contributed to this that's new or innovative, and your conclusion is taking the customer, taking your reader back to the problem that you introduced them to and saying, see how I fixed it. You make your claim, you tell them what you're going to claim in your introduction and your problem and your purpose statement, and in your conclusion you tell them, this is what I did to support my claim. And the reader should leave convinced that your research did actually accomplish what it set out to do. Now, as it relates to anything in the textbook beyond page 495, you do not need to read it. So you can stop reading when you see practice 14.3. Everything beyond page 495 all the way to the end of the chapter talks about all of the statistical methods which we didn't get into. This was not a course on statistical methods. PAD 4702 was that course that would have talked about all of this material here. Um, so you don't need to do that for this course, but because you own the textbook, I would bookmark these pages because at some point in your career you will likely be called upon to do some kind of statistical analysis and you'll want to be able to come back to these pages and understand them. And um, that's it. I appreciate it. This will be the last video that we do until the exam review for the final exam and I'll put together another video for that point in time. But at this point, good luck on your research projects. I look forward to reading your work. Um, a lot of very interesting material coming down the pipeline for me. I can see that already. Thanks.